we thought it would be good that most of the talk that Randy and I had been doing from the last time he was here also into uh, this week while we were together, we were talking about what a lot about it meant to be holy, the idea of scriptural holiness. And I think it's important for us to look at this word because for a long time, holiness has been pretty much associated with behavior. And what we do is either holy or not holy. And much of the New, New Testament specifically, and we'll be spending a lot of our time here as obvious, Randy hasn't read the Old Testament in a while, so he's... <laughs> yeah, I got one scripture. <laughs> So much of the New Testament refers much more to holiness being an identity, being a state of being more than it is a state of doing. And I thought it was important for us, and Randy really uh, took some time on it, obviously, to um, look through this and get an, get an appreciation of biblical holiness. And there's a grace associated with holiness. I, I, a lot of times we study specific words like grace or faith or this term holy or holiness. We tend to isolate them as subjects of their own, but the reality is they have to work together. So the grace of holiness, I think, is an important topic that we realize that, and I don't know how much we'll get into this, so I'll just share this now, that the word grace has much more to do with the idea of being empowered to do what you were always created to do. This term grace is the word charis in the Greek. And it means, uh, the actual word means the divine influence upon the heart. But it's a specific kind of influence that leads us to the way of life man was always created to live. So if you think about grace, not in terms of forgiveness and your sins are wiped away, grace, but the grace that actually empowers you to overwrite one way of life and walk in the divine way of life, you realize it's the grace that leads to or empowers us to holiness. So far, so good? Okay. The two are tied together. They're tied together. Right. Grace yeah. and holiness are definitely tied together. Yeah. That's why we don't want to talk about it. Yeah, we can't isolate either one of them. So uh, you want to wear this? Yeah. Do you know how to work it? You want me to start out with that scripture I started on last time? Yep. We talked about this when I was here a few months ago, and he said, let's just kind of springboard off that, that scripture you started because it caused some, it caused a few consternations to start with. So we'll maybe read that again. And it's in uh, 1 Corinthians 6. Let's start in verse 17. I'm going to back up two verses from what I said last time I was here. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. I backed up two verses because I think that's a, a really important foundation to lay. Um, I, I have heard this you know, taught many different ways. The way I really believe it is exactly how it says it. When we become one with the Lord, we don't have my spirit inside his spirit or two spirits in the same person. We become one spirit. We literally become the spirit of Jesus. When we receive his spirit, okay? It's different from the body, different from the soul, but it, we become one spirit. That's exactly what the scripture says. So... I want to lay that foundation so that, you know, what I say in a minute here, you won't, you know, have quite so much uh, consternation. consternation, as I said. <laughs> Flee immorality, because above that, he's talking about the bodies and surrendering, you know, uh, becoming one flesh and so forth and so on. Flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sin, uh, sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Whom you have from God and that you are not his own? 
For you have been bought with a price, therefore also glorify God in your body. And so when we become one with the Lord, I say it like this. How can the Lord himself, this is what I said, how can the Lord himself put his most precious thing, which is his spirit, inside something that's not holy? He not only won't do it, he can't do it. Whatever he is in, he's holy. He can't live inside of unholiness. Is that correct? Yeah. Right. Okay, sure. so if God is holy, he doesn't have holiness. Like God is love, he doesn't have love. It's not something that he can lose. It's something he is. So how can he put everything he is in something that's unholy? He can't. So when we change our paradigm about holiness, we have to learn to see ourselves in our spirit man as holy. Now we'll war against the flesh, we'll war against these things, and we'll talk about some of these, but the foundation of it is he puts himself in us and we are holy. The spirit of the man becomes one with the spirit of Christ and that spirit is holy. I'm not talking about our body, I'm not That's talking right. about the other stuff talking about the spirit okay does that make sense everybody good that's a really important distinction for you all to make because let's go back to what i originally said most of us still define holiness by how we behave okay now eventually i believe our behavior will align with this holiness of the spirit that is the design that's, that's the, right that's the intention but we have this belief that if I don't act holy, then I'm not. So far, so good. That's that's. Let's be honest. Most of us do have that, and the reality is, this. I mean, I, that that verse, verse seventeen. You can't argue with that. The idea that we're one with Him. This is first of uh, First Corinthians six seventeen is the prayer of John Jesus in John seventeen, that they may be one as you and I are one. As we join ourselves with Christ, we are joined in him and with him in the spirit. And it's from that place where actions and behaviors begin to change. That's why working from the outside in doesn't work. <laughs> when the spirit of holiness is inside of you, there's your engine for holy living. Right. Not external controls. Right. There's the beginning of true holiness. When you realize the spirit of you and the spirit of him are... One. One. That's the it's not two spirits competing. Yeah. We think we're always trying to like measure up spirit to spirit with Christ, and then we find out it's really impossible because when we receive a spirit, we already became one with him. Yep. We can't help but not, man I mean, we can't help but manifest Jesus when we let him out. We realize where he is and we just let him out. He goes, wow, that was really good. You guys mind jumping around your Bibles? It's not even up here, unless you wrote it up here. Romans 8. Just go there really quick. Is that one of yours? Not yet, no. No, I... Okay. Just go to Romans 8, because I, I feel like we just need to still get this in our heads, that the Spirit of Jesus and the Spirit of us become one. In Romans 8. There's no way we're going to cover all that tonight. Yeah, I, <laughs> <laughs> I think you got your work cut out very for, for a while, right? Yeah. You could talk about this topic for weeks, couldn't you? I mean, because it's so in-depth. Just look at verse 9. I mean, we could jump in almost anywhere here. Yeah. I'll just jump in in verse 9. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. Right. That's the main delineation of the New Testament, flesh and spirit, right? We've talked about this. You've seen the donut enough to know that flesh and spirit are the main delineations of a human being in the New Testament, okay? That's it. But look how he begins to mesh his spirit with our spirit if indeed the spirit of god dwells in you but if anyone does not have the spirit of christ he does not belong to him that's obvious right when we accept jesus holy spirit begins to dwell within us verse 10 if christ is in you look at this though the body is dead because of sin the spirit now how many people have their bibles and there is a you have capital s's for God's spirit and little s's for yours. Do you guys have that? Right here is where the, the, the meshing begins to take place because 
if Christ is in you, which is the spirit, though the body is dead, the spirit is alive because of righteousness. Right there. The spirits become one and the spirit of Jesus makes our spirit alive. The only way that continues in life is when they become one. Very similar to right. the marriage mystery of Ephesians chapter five. Am I saying that? That's little s spirit. Little s. Right. Yeah. Uh, That's us. Right. Yeah. So he begins to blend these two and the rest of the time you, re you read this, you realize that there is no differentiation anymore to Paul of our spirit versus his spirit which is huge. When you think about this, God is okay with that. There is this, these are my children, and the only way I'm going to fully adopt them into myself and make them part of who I am, I have to give them my spirit. And that's why those who worship him, worship him in spirit and in truth. That's his spirit. That's how we worship him, in his spirit, our spirit, and truth. Good? Uh -huh. You want to keep going? Matter, man. Okay, so Can I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jump in. So reconcile that, um, or, or like, so John three thirty, where he must increase, but I must decrease. How does that? Sure. How does that? Well, you're going to get us all sideways tonight, aren't you? <laughs> I love to do that. <laughs> Thanks, Aaron. All right. So, I, some of you might have heard us talk about this before. This idea, Autumn, I think you and I have talked about this before. So John the Baptist sees the Lamb of God coming, right? Yep. And when he, when he recognizes that, okay, this is the one I've been making way for, <laughs> he says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And then he recognizes, wow, it's time for me to back up and for Jesus to come to the fore, okay, to come to the prominence. Because I was his forerunner. My role was to make way for him. John the Baptist knew that was his role. The problem is we've taken verse 30 and we've applied it to us. You're right. It's not ours. It's not ours. That's true. That's right. Yeah. That's, why that's, the it up. that's the personal statement that he makes that most of us have interpreted for all the whole body of Christ. When yeah. he's saying no, because he's talking about the whole bridegroom coming as I have to decrease so that it's now your turn. I was the forerunner and now it's your turn. It's not the whole body of yeah. That's right. the misinterpretation yeah. of Scripture. It really is. Yeah. That was for John and John only. Yeah. Who is Jesus in the earth now? You and me. So we must what? Increase. Increase. Every time you shrink back, Jesus shrinks back. <laughs> okay. Hey, it tightened up in here, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. In the Old Testament, you weren't allowed to touch a leper. In the New Testament, you lay your hands on the lepers and they'll be whole. It's time for, there's seasons of time. In this season, John needed to decrease. In this season, every one of you better increase or the kingdom does not advance. Okay. Uh, let's go to, where do I want to be? Let's, let's talk about holiness a little bit. Is that okay? Rock and roll, whatever you, you like. Want, you got verses, I got verses. Where do you want to go first? We have verses. You have verses too. We. <laughs> we have corporate verses. We ins. Okay, let's just go over the lonely Old Testament verse over here. So we can at least honor <laughs> Exodus 20. <laughs> just go ahead and turn there. Exodus 22, Ooh. just so you can see this. Uh, I spent... Um, this morning, looking up and studying the phrase "be holy," because I like that idea of being holy. Nowhere in Scripture do you see doing holy. That's right. So a doing must be much less important than being holy. And so in Exodus twenty two thirty one, it there's a simple phrase here: "You shall be holy men to me." Holiness is always connected to the Lord. Okay? An Old Testament word is kodesh, Q-O-D-E-S-H, and it simply means to be clean, sanctified, or sacred. The only way an Old Testament 
priest would, was made holy is he was separated from people and he was uh, secluded with the Lord. Okay? The idea of being holy men to me, if you look at the, the context, he's talking about the priests. He's talking about those that will give their lives to the Lord. These Levitical priests took their lives out from the general population of the church, the Jewish nation, and they sacred or sanctified themselves, made themselves sacred to the Lord. Holiness is only connected to the person of the Lord. That's first and foremost. So the beginning of holiness is in the author of holiness. And uh, we were talking about this a little bit last night with Chuck, mm -hmm. because he was using the verse, be holy, for I am holy. Okay? And in that simple verse, and that is, uh, just so you know, that, is in 1 Peter. Give me just a second here. I just want to give you those verses. I didn't actually bring them out tonight. But um, it's 1 Peter 1.15. I might get there tonight. I might not. And Leviticus 11.44. I'm already at 1 Peter. You are? Yep. That one, was that one of your ones? Mm -hmm. Wow. 1 Peter 1.13. Okay. Yeah. Great. Okay. So he says, because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. That's not a, you better be holy because I am. I've, I used to always read that verse that way. Danielle, you better be holy because God is. And if you're not holy, then you can't be with God. The idea of that verse is not, you better be because I am. It's, I am so you can be. Be holy for I am holy. Be holy because I am holy. Just like that verse where it says, if you love me, you'll do what I command. When Jesus said that, remember he says that? If you love me, you'll do my commandments, right? Everyone thinks that verse, you'll prove your love for Jesus, Lord said, if you do what I told you to do. That's how we've always read that verse. The reality is in the Greek, it's actually, if you love me, you'll be able to do what I've commanded you. My love empowers us right. to walk in what he's commanded us. Exact same phrase here. You shall be holy men to me or unto me which means as we devote ourselves to the person of the Lord, the holiness of the Lord becomes us, becomes our holiness. So instead of this practicing and doing and disciplining ourselves in the holiness, has anybody ever tried to be holy? And failed. It's miserable because you can only try in the flesh. And we just read in Romans 8 that those two things are at war with each other. So you cannot put to death the deeds of the flesh with the flesh. That's what Paul told us in Romans 8. You must walk by the Spirit. And if the Spirit of God is holy, that's our beginning. So that word Kadesh from Exodus 22 is this empowerment to be holy. You know what? As you hang out with me, Levites, as you spend time with me, I'm not just going to clean you from the outside. I'm actually going to empower you to be holy. From the inside out. This is not a New Testament idea. This is a God idea throughout time. I want to start reading in 13. Now, this is uh, 1 Peter 1 13. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. That's why you're preparing your minds for action because you're keeping sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So, grace. And these things only comes through you, comes to you through the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's the only way you can receive grace is through revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not just because. It actually comes as a revelation. How can you keep your spirit? How can you walk by grace? How can you understand grace unless it comes by revelation from the Lord? You can't. Otherwise, your mind will always say, I have to, I have to, I have to. Because even at the very first where he says action, he says, prepare your mind for action. I believe we have even misinterpreted that mm. where we're like, we're getting ready to, to put works in our mind. No, what he's saying is, I want you to be thinking right about your actions. That's how I, that's how I can imagine him saying that. Prepare your mind for action. Like mm -hmm. your mind has to think right about your action mm. instead of get ready. You're going to have to act a lot. That's how we normally think about that. Instead of 
get your mind right in the right state of mind so for actions. actions. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. So that your actions will be proper mm -hmm. instead of doing it out of works. And we'll talk a lot about works. We'll talk a lot about action. Then it has, the grace has to be revealed to you from the Lord. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts with which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Also. Right. So there's a clear delineation <laughs> between your spirit and your behavior. Behavior. Mm. Yeah. The word is actually the same behavior and conversation. I looked it up today mm -hmm. in the Greek, and it means the same thing behavior and conversation. Mm. So there's two different things that you're holy in. And even when, and I'll show you another scripture, he's, he talks about even in the marriage, you're holy in your body and you're holy in your spirit. It's two different things. And, and we'll maybe talk about yeah, that a little bit more. I'd like to go there. That's good. <clears throat> but like the Holy One who has called you, be holy yourselves also. That word is definitely in there. I looked at it also, which means in addition to the holiness you already have, be holy in your behavior. That's the process he's talking about of lining up your behavior with your holiness you already have in you. Because if you're guided by revelation of grace, Come on. then Come on. your behavior will line up with your spirit that's already holy. Because you know what grace is, you know what the spirit is. That's why Paul says, all things I can, I can do, everything, but it's not lawful. I mean, it's, it's lawful for me, but it's not beneficial. It could help some, it could hurt some. That's when you have to understand what grace is and wisdom and not offending people and all that other stuff. But this is so important right here because, again, there's a number of scriptures where he differentiates between your holiness inside and your holiness outside. Just exactly like we talked about last time I was here, the spirit on you, the spirit in you, and the spirit with you. There's a big, big difference between how the Holy Spirit interacts with you. Same exact thing with holiness and grace. Then he goes on to say, because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy, what he was talking about earlier. So that sets up our minds to think clearly, fixing our spirit because of the revelation of Jesus Christ of grace. We really are holy. Then we realize we're really holy. Well, our behaviors can line up with it because then it's easy. And we're not fighting against the flesh because our minds are already lined up with our spirit. He says, keep focused on your spirit. Keep focused on, put your attention in the right place instead of the works. He says, prepare your mind, but, but keep, your, keep, your, keep your focus on your spirit. Then it's easy. Sorry. That's why it's so important about the identity. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And it is, it is a process over time of, and you can even look through, there's many, many places in the Bible where it talks about through these things you are sanctified. It's different from holy. That's the sanctification of your soul and the things that just kind of fall off of you because you know who you are, because of all these different things that the Lord has revealed to you. Instead of trying to be holy, you are holy. Your spirit, man, is holy. Back to the very first verse I read. How can it be any different mm -hmm. if you become one with Christ? It's physically impossible. It's spiritually impossible. Right. Right. But yet we still beat our heads on the wall trying to be holy. The more we love the Lord, the more our actions or our behavior, our conversation aligns with that. So are you holy? Duh. <laughs> Why? Because he is. That's the answer. We are holy because he is. Now, someone will argue with you and say, well, you're not acting very holy, like probably your spouse at some point in time might say, dude. Maybe. Uh, you, you might be holy, but you ain't acting holy. You know? And that's the sanctification process. That's the... Because... The soul is where so much of the decisions are being made about how we'll actually live. 
Will you live according to the holiness you've been provided? <laughs> and so, but, do you have a verse you want to go to? Yeah, I'm gonna, I, I want to pull that verse out about the differentiating body and spirit. It's yeah. uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 7, 34. Let's give me a second to get there. 1 Corinthians 7, 34. The woman who is unmarried and the virgin is concerned about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and spirit. But one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. It goes on to talk about you know marital relationships. But that verse stuck right in there is the clear differentiation for a woman to think the difference between her body and her spirit. Because it's two different, it's holy in her body and holy in her spirit. It's the also. It's right. It's two completely different things. <clears throat> Questions so far? You guys okay? Yeah? Man, they're quiet tonight. They are. I'm not used to this. Maybe I should stand and dance or something. <laughs> My daughter just said, do over not here. let him dance. It's like, is like this the bride side and this the groom side? <laughs> <laughs> Poor groom. <laughs> What's that? Like I see how it shows the difference, but I, I'm, okay, I, maybe I hypothetically see it. But show me again. The woman who is unmarried and the virgin <clears throat> is concerned about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. The things that she's concerning herself with because she's a virgin, she's unmarried, and her focus is on the Lord. She's both. She's looking at herself both to be holy in her body, right? The significant the significance of that is a virgin, okay, and holy in her spirit. So there's a clear differentiation between holiness in her body and holiness in the spirit, and it's represented because it says she's unmarried and a virgin. So she's still con right. She's still concerned about the holiness in her body. I'm still a virgin. That's completely dealing with the flesh, her body, and holiness in the spirit. Two different things. If, it, if they were the same thing, they would only say it with, with one word instead of with two. Does that make sense? Okay. Can you explain any better than that? No, that's how I would have explained it. <clears throat> he, he paints both a natural picture and a spiritual picture of the same principle. She's not as holy. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's as much about that as, as it not. is. A, it's, it's a clear, like, way in Scripture of physical holiness is virginity. She's still a virgin. Okay, great. So was Mary. Okay, that's the picture of physical holiness. That's why the Lord came through a virgin. She still has physical, the rep representation of holiness in the Bible. Okay? It's not individual. It's not, you know, like uh, singling out an individual. It's a principle that's really talking about. Yeah, so if you think about that original definition of holiness, it's keeping yourself sacred. And virginity is that. It's, virginity is keeping yourself for one. I think it's a natural picture of spiritual holiness. Yeah, but... I think the main part of that verse is the idea that both the body and the spirit have opportunities to be holy. I think that's his main point um, here. So good? Undefiled. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, let's not talk about marriage tonight. <laughs> <laughs> another verse i got lots of them Good one. romans 11 how about that let's look at romans 11 Turn with me i'm going way past it
Romans 11, 6. Mm-hmm. Uh, excuse me, 16. There is, a, there is a 6 on here, and there is a 16. I wrote both of them down, but I wanted to handle 16 first while we're on holiness. If the first piece of dough is holy, the lump is also. And if the root is holy, the branches are too. You get it? If you're holy, you're holy. If you're not, you're not. I mean, how else can you say it? It's just, it's so many places. It's just so clear to me in the word. You know, and then he goes on to talk about, you know, the different pieces and parts. They're all holy. Even in uh, um, Isaiah chapter 6, the last verse talks about the seed of holiness. If you remember in, a le- in the very last verse, it says, and the, the tree is felled and burned, but the stump of the, you know, the tenth remains, the seed of holiness. Everything around, all of the things that can burn up in our life, but there's always the holiness inside of us. That is the seed of holiness that always remains inside of us, no matter what happens with us. So this, let's jump back up here. Yeah, I like six. I like six too. (laughs) Verse six. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, Mm -hmm. grace is no longer grace. Very important. Mm -hmm. So you can either choose to live by the law, and there's many places in Romans and chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7, and even chapter 8 where it talks about the law. And it talks about grace, and it talks about sanctification, and righteousness, and all these things. And it says the law is good. The law is spirit. The law was given by God for us to help us and show us what sin was. It wasn't to condemn us or anything else. It was good. It even says that many times. The law is good. The law was spirit. It's right in Romans. It is. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but if we choose to keep on living by that, then grace goes away. No effect has no effect and so if we still live under a works mentality we really throw away our holiness we don't realize the holiness we have inside i can't say we throw away our holiness we throw away the possibility of our natural man lining up with our spirit man ever because we will constantly fight in the natural to gain the holiness that we already have already have it's such a difficult process, but it's right here. It's not here. It's in the mind. It's in the soul that plagues us, where like the seed of unbelief plagues us. So many places in the scripture I, I read today and many times before, righteousness through faith. What's righteousness? It's everything that's inside God. All the attributes, all the character, all the nature, everything of God. How do we get it? By faith. The same with grace is by faith. All these things come to us just by faith. That is not a mental process. That is done by the Spirit and just being obedient. And then the thoughts come to us through our own fleshly way of thinking that we have to somehow go back and attain it. Because that's the way we're raised, that's the way we're taught, all the stuff that I was, forever I was taught that. And it's just not true. How can we attain something we already have? It's like, how can you attain the identity you already have? You already have holiness inside of you, exactly the same as you already have this identity inside of you. How do you attain that? You has to be revealed, right? The understanding has to go first. Uh, I'm trying to take a look at what you guys are doing. I'm a mechanical person, so I go ahead and take a look at this statement. The Jewish people didn't have a way because they understood God through the religion or uh, to rationalize things. To go ahead and perform the they couldn't link up to God the Father because they it was they couldn't do that. That's true. Right. I didn't see him that way. Okay. Mm-hmm. So whenever Jesus Christ comes, it's the 
deeply to Christ meant that now I'm a son of God. That you're a son of God. That you're daughters of God. Okay, so then everything that you're linked with now, that he made you, you're part of him. That's right. So now the, the complexity can go ahead and go away because now you think differently. Because now you have a relationship <laughs> by faith being in Christ. Christ had faith that he was a son of God. So now you have that same faith that you are that son. And now you receive those same benefits. Grace is mm-hmm. given because of the way that you think, not because of what you do. That's right. Yeah. I have a question. Um, this seems to be very short. Being like this, just for the lack of a better word, um, everyone <coughs> is holy. Is, is that in um, the uh, nine Christians? I don't really like using that word, but what is it that makes you holy? I guess I like uh, to know that. But. The very first verse we shared. When the Holy Spirit indwells us, that's why he's called Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> Not the unholy spirit. Yeah. <laughs> As he indwells you, you become holy. And then it's a process by which we live from that place, which we become and actually do who we are. We spend the rest of our life doing that. But no, I don't believe it's for everybody. I believe it's for those who have allowed Holy Spirit to dwell within them. Welcome. That's the only way it can. Yeah. Yeah, on our, he, that's where the grace comes from that empowers us to walk that way. Okay. Yeah, I mean, when he, when his spirit and our spirit become one, we literally get swallowed up and can't be seen anymore. It's like putting water into water. It's, uh, you, you can't take him apart. Where, that's right. It's no where longer I that lives. I think a lot of the denominations fall down is... It's not that they don't talk about that these scriptures that we're talking about. It's that they don't have an understanding of who the Holy Spirit is. For me, when you receive the Lord, you receive all of the Lord, including his spirit. You can't separate them because they can only come through the Holy Spirit. Salvation can only come through the Holy Spirit. And it's not even Jesus that lives inside of you, even though we normally say that it is his Holy Spirit that lives inside us. Even though you'll say, you know, Lord, come into my life as just kind of a, a regular prayer. Well, it's actually his spirit. We would we wouldn't normally say, you know, Holy Spirit, come in and cleanse me and all this other stuff. We would say, you know, Lord, come into my life and so forth. But it's actually the Holy Spirit. Okay. So if you if you belong to denomination, I won't name any, just I don't want to offend anybody. But if you, you know, are being taught by a denomination that doesn't believe in the Holy Spirit, then you will constantly try and work yourself into holiness because he literally is the power and the nature of Jesus and the Father indwelling in you. And it allows you to be holy. This is who I am. And then the process the rest of your life is lining up everything of who you are with that spirit that's inside you. That's the rest of our life's journey. Yeah. Right there. It's a life journey. Yeah. It is not about your job and all that kind of stuff that we've faced. It is about aligning the rest of us with that Holy Spirit right. joined with ours. There was a that's question asked last, last night when we were sitting around, and I used the two scenarios. One is the finished work of Christ over here on the left. He bought and paid for everything, all the power. All the glory, all the sin was killed, all the disease was killed, all the torment was dead. So we don't have to worry about it anymore. We, we, this is like the completed work of Christ, and all you have to do is just live in it. Then there is, every time something happens to you, every time you, you know, think a bad thought, every time you do whatever, lie, cheat, steal, whatever it is, you have to go and repent for every little thing. And neither of those are true. It's somewhere in the middle. Because if you think it's completed and don't have to do anything, 
this is like, I can do anything I want to and get away with it. I can sleep with anybody. I can take drugs. I can do blah, blah, blah. And God will forgive me. And you know what? That may be true, but you do not know the Holy Spirit. You have this lawless, he'll just love me. And no matter what I do, it's all cool. Everything's going to be fine in the end. Yeah, can I clarify something? He's not saying that Jesus' work isn't finished. Right. He's I just said saying it was true. Our attitude right. toward the finished work right. is, ah, eh, he's covering it all. I can do whatever the H I want now. I'll that's be right. fine. Yeah, that's right. right. And he has done all those things. That's why I say he has done all those things. But I still have to discipline my body. I still have to discipline my soul. I still have to do exactly what we're talking about doing and lining myself up with what's already been done for me and through me. That spirit is already inside me, but I still have to line up my body with it. I just can't do whatever I want to, even though, you know, I know the Lord will forgive me. I have an understanding of his love. I really do. I have a genuine understanding. I have encountered his love. So has Mark. So have all you guys so deeply. Sometimes, you know, he loves you and forgives you. That doesn't give you permission. You can read it all through the scripture to go out and do whatever you want to, because it leads to lawlessness and your fire will grow cold. And when your fire grows cold, you know what happens. You know, we don't want to go and talk about all that stuff. But again, those are the extremes where everything is wrong and then nothing is wrong. Right on. You have to have balance in it. You have to have balance in it. They call it hyper grace or religion. You can use those like extremes. You hear people, you know, bashing hyper grace. There is a tremendous message in the what they call hyper grace. There is so much truth in it. But what they're doing is sometimes swinging us outside the pendulum of religious thinking to get us thinking, oh, yeah, I really am holy inside. And then it'll swing back and go, yeah, but there is still work to do. That's right. <laughs> Right. Some of the teaching is you don't have to repent anymore because your sins have all been forgiven. And that's just foolishness. Right. Yep. And that's what, that's what I believe. There's a difference between grieving the Holy Spirit and quenching the Holy Spirit. They make a differentiate, differentiation in the scripture between the two. <clears throat> Do you want to address that? I just looked up the scripture where it says it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, it's Ephesians 4.30. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment so that it will give grace to those who hear, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So uh, I, I believe there is a grieving that happens when our <clears throat> actions and soul have not yet aligned with the nature and character of Christ on the inside of us. Um, at least that seems to me that's what he's saying here. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with malice. That's the whole context of do not grieve the holy spirit um what reference is that uh, ephesians 4 29 through 31 um i just want to look up what the word grieve means there for you yeah it actually means to make sad yeah no, it just means like, uh, you know, I think God still experiences all the emotions that we do. And so as much as he loves us and wants what's best for us, and then we act outside of what his nature is on the inside of us, I think he's sad. Just like when I watch my children act outside of their identity. Oh, man, there's so much more than that. So I, I don't think it's like a grieving of I give up. That's it. Sandy's off the list. You know, type of thing. I think it's just, I mean, I think there is a sadness, but then like, there's also the, nope, we're getting back up tomorrow morning and we're trying again. Let's go. I think that's what Paul says about working out our salvation with fear and trembling. I think there's a working out of this work that was done for us. Okay. Jesus finishes a great and powerful work and then he leaves the work of salvation up to us. 
not only what we will do with it on the inside, but what we would do with it with the rest of mankind. Will we spread it? Will we acknowledge, will we love in such a way where people are empowered by this same salvation we've been empowered by? I think it's a working out of that salvation. Um, Every time I read this series of verses, you know, I, I don't like to normally just take one verse. I'll go back and read the context. The context of 28, 29, 30, 31, and 32 is about how you treat somebody else. Mm -hmm. How you speak to somebody else, how you love or the lack of love towards somebody else. And so he's saying, don't do these things because you're going to hurt somebody else. And when you hurt somebody else, that grieves the Holy Spirit. So when you speak this way to people, when you use such a word, use it to edify according to the need of the moment. So it will be, so it will give grace to those who hear. So when you don't give grace to those who hear, you grieve the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? It's supposed to give grace. The words you say are supposed to give grace to people that hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So he's saying the Holy Spirit is inside of you and sealed all these things inside of you. So when you speak to people, don't grieve the Spirit. The very next verse is, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with malice. Those are all towards other people. Same exact context. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven us. So think about this picture. Let's say all of you have a young child and you have been working with them on a particular area of their character. And you know that the progress that they have made, you know that the, the time spent and the pain that they've gone through in this process of improving this particular area of your life, their life that you've been working on. And then one of their friends comes along and just rips them for this area of their character that isn't right yet. Just tears them down, tells them they're no good, that you're, you're just, you're, you're worthless because of this particular character trait, but you know the work that you've been doing with them in that area, but that person that just tore them up doesn't have any recognition of that and completely destroys them in the midst of that process you're working with them. How do you feel? Yeah, you're probably grieved. You're grieved because you know what you've been working through with your child. They don't. All they see is the slip up. And they tear your child up for the slip up instead of recognizing the process that you as their parent and the child have been going through together. The Lord's doing the exact same thing with all of us. You know, I don't like to use the word process a whole lot around here because we use it enough. But the point is every single one of us is walking through some area with the Lord. There's a particular area maybe he's got his finger on with you and you're saying together, let's, let's, let's walk through this together. Let's walk through this and pass this together. And then someone comes in and just tears it up and almost as if everything that's been built is threatened to be crushed. Holy Spirit's grieved. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good picture of what you just described. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah. How many times has that happened to us? Or how many times have we done that maybe? Yeah, I've yeah. done it. Right. Yeah. It's not, I, I know this can be Jewish in me that we feel something that there's confidence, but it, it's, I don't know, I always kind of always thought that when you do these things that you stop, like put a hammer, like if it's between you and God, like there's a cut between you, but I, I'm guessing that that's probably not what really happens. Yeah. So it's kind of like you said, okay, you're. Yeah, that is a very God, law God, way of looking at. Uh, our relationship with the Lord, but now where sin abounds, grace abounds more. Right. So there's more available. Instead of a separation occurring now, there's actually, uh oh, my child needs more of me. You know, it's like, <laughs> I hate to say it, you got to sin more to get more of God. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying he recognizes that there's a need for him. And so he actually draws near in that moment, not separates from him. Yeah, in that scenario, it separates, and there's actually. The way you're saying it, God retreats from you, yeah, which is right, which is not accurate. Uh, it's not accurate. So, it's, it's actually 
not only more need, but he recognized and go, I'm going to that person because they need more grace right now. So when they're under so much junk, the Lord's like, and just blows on you more because, you, you, yeah, you. because you're getting hammered with all this junk. Yep. It's the exact opposite of the way most of it's been taught. Like the way you said it, it puts a hammer between you and God. Yeah, it's opposite of that. Yeah, that's what the word means. Yeah, the word actually just means. Yeah, oh. it doesn't separate it quiet. How about that? Yeah. Every time you every time you hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, and you don't obey it, we've been taught that He leaves, and it's not accurate. Or He stops talking. Well, if you're not going to listen to me, I'm going to shut up. Right. Yeah, right. that's not Him at all. What? <laughs> on uh, on our end. Our end, we cease to hear what he's saying because it gets quieter and quieter and quieter, not because he stops talking to us. He talks to the world. He talks to unbelievers. They have no idea what holiness. We do. We should be able to hear him so much more clear than the world does. But like we were saying last time, the Holy Spirit with us, that's the whole world. They can all hear him, you know? Yeah. So it's the same thing. It's the more we disobey and don't follow the voice of the Holy Spirit, it's like, cotton gets put in our ears our spiritual ears it's, we have a tendency to think he leaves because he's ticked off at us <laughs> when we come to a point maybe after years and years of being so deep in the lord uh this has nothing to do with what we're talking about this is like you know decades of this kind of thing then he'll take his spirit so that's a different thing. Though. Yeah. Last week we talked about Psalm 22, where David says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's about when his son dies after the sin of Bathsheba. And we talked about that in reference to Jesus on the cross when he says the same thing. And the reference has no meaning whatsoever to God moving away from David. It actually is God's choices. Sorry, David's choices actually deafen himself to the Lord. So it's, it's, it's not that far removed from the story of the prodigal son. All right, Dad, I think I got this. See ya. I'm going to go do things my way. And then he realized, I think I need to go back to Daddy. There's this feeling of, God, where have you gone? And God's like, I haven't left. You, you kind of did your own thing for a while, but I've been with you. But if, I, I'd like to think that, yeah. I was just talking with someone this morning that have you ever kind of like you know you're you you know you've got like this line in your spirit and you know when you cross it? Anybody have that? You just kind of know, uh oh. Yeah, I'm over in the no fly zone. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. The fact that you know it is huge. Oh yeah. To the Lord. It's when you stop knowing you're there. That's the dangerous That's one. the dangerous place. Right. When you know you're there and you better get back, God's like, that's my kid. Yeah? You know, and I think that's that's where we all are. So, yeah, to your, to your statement, Becky, I, th I think that God's kids who have his Holy Spirit have that line. And you're like, yeah, I'm over here. And I probably shouldn't be. And I think it's time to go back. Yeah. I want to read this. It's another scripture I have up here. It's 2 Timothy 2. It is a trustworthy uh, statement for if we died with him we will also live with him if we endure or suffer we will also reign with him if we deny him he will also deny us if we are faithless this is actually deny also it's the same word it's dis disbelieve or disobey that's what that is if we disbelieve or disobey, he remains faithful. Those are two different words. Faithless and faithful are completely different in the Greek. I looked it up today. That word, it says he remains faithful. It says objective, 
sure and trustworthy. So if we disbelieve or disobey, he remains sure and trustworthy and objective for he cannot deny himself. Okay, so I want you to reread that scripture and I want you to think in terms of our spirit and his spirit are one. So the faithful one is where? In us. Now read it again. Just read that again. If we, dis or if we disbelieve or disobey, he remains objective and sure Inside of you. and trustworthy, for he cannot deny himself. Right in here. Right. There's your line. Because those faith, faithless and faithful, I wonder, I wonder if that's the same word, and they're not. Yeah. They're different words. It's translated faithful and faithless. I went. They're not the same word. Mm -hmm. Not even close. All right. All right. Wow. Does that make more sense? Yes? No? Any questions? Comments? Yeah. Smart remarks? <laughs> <laughs> The, uh, the idea, I don't know why we're hammering on this, but I think we need to. There's something in the spirit that I still feel like, and uh, Sandy's the only one that's not afraid to vocalize it, <laughs> but I just got to wonder if we're still struggling with this idea of internal holiness. That Holy Spirit and our spirit are really one. That we really already have the fullness of God inside of us. That really we have already been made complete. Colossians 2. That's right. Do we really believe this? Like Ephesians 1. Can we just go there? I think I have that up there. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 1. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, Anybody working for a blessing? Yeah. It's already in us. The blessing given to us has already been given to us in Jesus. The idea of working for blessing is Old Testament, Sandy. Yeah, it's okay. Thanks for admitting it. I appreciate it. But we, now, don't get me wrong. I still believe there is favor that is bestowed upon us when we walk in a way that's pleasing to God. But you have to realize that all of the blessings of the Lord are accessible within us. Look at this. Who has blessed us with a few spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. Every. Who has, I'm going to read it again. Who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Where are the heavenly places? In us. Yeah. <laughs> what is it with y'all and donuts? We love the donuts here in PA. It, if, if you look at this before you finish that next verse. Sure. Because it, it says, in the heavenly places in Christ, look in Ephesians 2, 6, and raised us up with him and made us to sit with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So it's not somewhere far off in the by and by. Okay. Now. Thank you. <laughs> Just so they don't think. That. So the heavenly places, the in Christ is here <clears throat> among us, in us right now. This is not for us to go to someday when we finally <clears throat> gotten rid of this body and oh, this life on earth is finally over. All I know is I'm not home yet. <laughs> this is <laughs> and throw your shoe at them. <laughs> oh, man. They're playing Sunday night, so I've got to be careful. But that is not correct theology at all. It doesn't line up in any of the New Testament. We are already at home in Him. The fullness of everything was purchased for us is available now in Christ. Where is there no condemnation? 
in Christ Jesus, not in heaven after you die, in him right now has been blessed. Have you been blessed with every spiritual blessing? Okay, I'm beating that thing to a pulp because it is a mindset. You will leave here tonight and your flesh will still say BS because I've seen stuff in my own life that doesn't line up. No, that's because we are still working out that salvation, still applying the holiness within to the holiness without. Okay? Just as he chose us, verse 4, in him. When did he choose us in him? What? Not when I got saved. Not when I finally got my head out of my you-know-what and said yes. <laughs> When did he choose us? Before the foundation of the world. Already a done deal. That's why Jesus, it says the Lamb of God was crucified before the foundation of the world. This was already a decided, finished work then. These are going to be my kids. All right, Daddy. They're going to be your kids. I'll be the big brother. Okay, thanks, son. Yeah. Yeah. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. So whose choosing is it that we be holy and blameless? His. his. <clears throat> not if Corey acts right. Not if Arnie gets his you-know-what out of his you-know-what. <laughs> no, but because of God's choosing, you are holy. Man, I'm telling you guys, right. this is a revelation that your spirit needs to get. Actually, your spirit already has it. Your mind needs to get. Some babies are jumping in this room tonight because deep within you, your spirit's going, yes! Inform your brain of what he just <laughs> said! <laughs> just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him not might be not could be yeah it is a decision of his will right. that we will be holy that's right in christ we are is this helping i hope so now faith is right right on all right on so let's just tear apart the greek word holy for a second go ahead okay amen it's hagios h-a-g-i-o-s and it means the same thing as it means in the Hebrew. It means sacred. But um, if you look it up in the Strong's, it actually connects two other Greek words to it. So I just want to bring these out to you. Uh, the first word, and I, I don't know how many of you even write this down. I know Angie's back there just waiting for me to say them, so thank you. It's hagnos, H-A-G-N-O-S, which means clean, innocent, modest, and perfect. So he chose us that we would be clean, innocent, modest, and perfect. Thank you, Lord, that you've chosen me to be this way. And then the other word. Do you have to be modest? Well, <laughs> yeah, still working on it. The other word is thalpo. And I, I'm curious how this uh, connects, but it's the word to warm or to brood. It means to cherish. The King James Version is the word cherish. So I'm wondering why he puts those things together. And all of a sudden I realize that when I look at the context of Ephesians 1, he says that he chose us, that we would be holy and blameless. And all of a sudden, I just like, blah, my, my mind-blown moment, where we become holy in the brooding and warming presence of the Father. Say that again. We become holy, clean, innocent, modest, and perfect in the brooding and warming presence of our Father. Uh -huh. So Holy Spirit is what? The Spirit of the Father, the Spirit of Jesus, right? Jesus said, my Father will send the Spirit, our Spirit, and He will, in His presence, cause the holiness inside of you to become the holiness from you, out of you. Is anybody waiting for your actions to line up with what we're talking about inside? Oh, I am. And this is how it happens. This is what I've been wanting to talk about all night. How do we do holy? All right, we're, we've already pounded for the last hour that we are. Now, how do we do it, Devin? Because I want to do it. I want to be it for you. I'm tired of hurting people. Anybody else? Yeah. 
uh, well, I think our nature and our personality is true. But I think like, so for example, one of the fruits of holiness, what I think is the main one is love. So Becky's love and Mark's love will look different because of our characters and our personalities. But at the end of the day, like, it'll just feel the same. Like the love of Jesus comes through you and I both. So yeah, you're right. The process is different. The walk we get, take to get there is different. But at the end of the road, the fruit of the spirit is still the fruit of the spirit, which is love, right? So in Jesus, we're restored to a pre-appointed position of holy, already appointed for us. We're brooded over and cherished by him into a place of cleanliness, innocence, and perfection. That is just beautiful when I think about this. That's what the relationship with God is all about. It's the transformation. It's the renewing of our mind. It's being translated from the kingdom of darkness into light. All these things we've talked about. Now our spirit begins to align itself with our actions. Oh, I love this. You got something? You want to? Um, if you look at uh, Colossians 1, it's one of the verses I wrote down here, Colossians 1, 21 through 23. Uh, and although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, right here, engaged in evil deeds in your body, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death, in his fleshly body through death. That gives you the power to overcome your fleshly body through his fleshly body's death. In order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach, if indeed you continue in the faith firmly established, what's that? There's our part. Right. If indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel, didn't say perfect, remain steadfast and don't move away from the hope of the gospel. He doesn't say you have to remain perfect. You have to remain steadfast in the hope of the gospel. It's the gospel that gives you hope, not perfection. But we'll interpret that. If we remain steadfast and firm in our faith, then we're holy. Or then he'll present us. No, we have to keep our affections toward the hope of the gospel. Yep. It's only hope is the spirit, just like love is. It's the same as in, in, in Galatians 5.22. You, uh, in the faith, firmly established and steadfast and not move away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under earth and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. He's made a minister through all these things. But he's, he also shows you that your mind and your body has been reconciled through the death of the Lord. Your mind, your thoughts, and your body has been reconciled through that stuff. And there's all kinds of scriptures that, that back that up. We just don't have time to go into all that stuff. Oh, I can't get away from this. I'm sorry. <laughs> go to Ephesians chapter 5. After what he just read, it makes absolute sense to go to Ephesians 5, which is up here. But we're kind of checking these off here. We're doing pretty well. We've got most of them done. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 5. The great verse is about marriage. You know, husband, love your wives. I, th I think it's pretty much just wives submit to your husbands. It's pretty much what I get from <laughs> It's the verse. <laughs> we forget about the one right after it, don't whatever, we? Whatever, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Something else he says there. All right. Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Okay. So there's a very clear thing here. He loved the church. So he loved the church enough to die for her. Okay. That's past tense. Verse 25 is a past tense reference to Jesus Christ dying for us because of his love for us at that time. And he gave himself up for her. But then in 26 becomes a present tense. Okay. 
so that he might, so he loves her enough that he dies for her, and now they're joined together as one, okay? Remember, our spirit and Holy Spirit now become one. There's a, a purpose in this, and we get to find out here what it is, so that he might sanctify her. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a once and done deal. Okay, you're holy, we're good, that's it, we're out. See you later, right. heaven one day. He'll sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word that he might present to himself the church in all her glory. glory. Holy, uh oh, holy's getting bigger. <laughs> <laughs> holy becomes the fullness. Our, our nature align, or sorry, our behavior aligns with our nature. The flesh shrinks, holy and the holiness and our spirit increases because his goal is, is that we would eventually have no spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. The whole point of this marriage between Jesus and his church is so that everything that's on the inside of us becomes manifested outside of us. That's the process of holiness. He's not talking about, like, the whole thing. Uh, he's talking about individuals that make up the body. The body. Right. Yep. It's individuals. You and I make up the right. body of Christ. He's not talking about, oh, the whole body is all yeah. cleansed and sanctified at right. one time. No, it's the process of every individual. But that was the power of the sanctification process, what he just read right mm -hmm. there. It gives you power over sin. You read in Romans. If you, if you look through all of Romans, Romans is an incredible book oh, I love it. about sin, about nature, about all kinds of stuff. And literally the power of sin is de dead. And we only give it life and power by submitting to it. It has no more power over us because of that holiness inside of us. And then once we submit to it, we give it authority, we give it power. Ah, give it authority. Oh, when we submit to the holiness on the inside of us, we give it authority over us. Right. Dude, there's yeah. a revelation. Yeah, when we submit to that. Not this anymore. That's right. Whatever we submit to, we give authority to yep. to take over. Just like whatever you put your focus and your attention on, you give authority over yourself right because on. it goes right in your spirit and transforms you from the inside, whether it's good or bad. So if you give this the same thing that you have been giving this, mm -hmm. huh, wow, the transformation is just like bang, 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 bang. Yeah. So he and I were talking last night about, you know, he was saying that the enemy has power. And I was like, well, wait a minute. The enemy was rendered powerless on the cross, but then we also talked in Bible study before about how does the enemy get power? We give it to, give him. It to him. As long as this has influence in our life, as long as this gets some submission from us, enemy still has power. The enemy has power on the planet right now because flesh still exists in humanity. Right. Even though we don't personally give him power in many things, many people do. Mm -hmm. And that, that power that other people have given still will affect us. us. So it's personal versus corporate or yeah. society so, or culture or whatever. So my personal process of bringing holiness within to holiness without affects yours and vice versa. That's why this is it's an individual process that leads to corporate dynamic. We need each other. We can't just, all right, I got my thing going on. I'm not affecting anybody else. My struggle is my struggle. Would you just stay out of my business? My business? No, you can't because it's affecting me. I am my brother's keeper for this purpose. Yeah. Isn't that awesome? That's not whole yet. Yep. It's made up of individuals. That's right. We decide whether we'll be part of that or not. True. True. We decide. We, we're not forcing it being part of the bride. He's already made his decision. That's right. His decision, hopefully, is influencing ours. <laughs> this is a daily choosing. This right. is not, oh, I got saved back in 1990. No, this is an ongoing daily, I choose life. I choose this holiness. I choose, I love this, submitting to that authority on the inside of me versus this authority. Yeah. I think there's a part, like 
we like absolutes, kind of, right? Like we are or we are not. But there's that whole becoming that we have to be okay with, that we're working for. So like if I say somebody's holy and somebody's unholy, but I don't see the potential for their holiness in them, then I've just excluded them. So why should I even bother with them? Right? You could say it that way. Yeah. <laughs> but I see the potential there. Right. That's right. Yeah. I mean, I that, think Sandy was, I don't know if she was sort of skirting around that or not. Like, what do you do with an unholy person? I mean, we, I don't know that we say, you're unholy, like, I need to stay away from you or whatever, but they have that potential to be holy. And that's the Christ in them that we need to be drawn to. Mm -hmm. Who did the Lord say to stay away from? I, I, I quoted Rick yeah. today in that thing where he said, Ecclesia, which is the church without koinonia, is like uh, having the form of godliness, and quote of scripture, having the form of godliness and not the power thereof. Stay away from these men because they're using the form of God and not the power of God. So he normally says to stay away from the people that know better. They're, you know, doing things in the place that God wants his anointing, his spirit, and man is taking over that when they shouldn't be doing it. Not people that are just doing normal, you know, wrong yeah, stuff. I, yeah, I think there's a, a, a clear delineation between when you encourage our brother who's stumbling versus the one who's seared in their conscience. I think there's a difference between those two. I think we have a responsibility to our brother and our sister to say, hey, I know who you are. This isn't who you are. Come on. But then after a very long period of time where they just refuse and are disobedient, you know what? I got to step away. Paul even says, I've turned them over to Satan <laughs> for the buffeting of their own soul. Yeah. yeah, that's in Corinthians 5, but that's an indictment. That I'm chapter sure. is an indictment on the leadership because they're so perverse that the Holy Spirit has told them repeatedly to stop sleeping around. And that's the leadership of that church. So he says, I'm having to translate myself in the spirit to judge the situation because you knotheads can't do it. You're all mature and you're sleeping with everybody. What's wrong with you? It actually says they're boasting in the fact right. that these guys are in their church. Look how much grace we have. We let everyone and anyone be a part of the ecclesia. Paul's like, what? No, that's not the spirit of ecclesia. No, it's you challenge them. You hold them to the standard from which they were purchased. Yeah. So back to the, back to the original part of it. I don't think it's up to us to say who's holy and who's not. We call out the person inside. We can't judge by their action even. Even though I've done a lot of bad things, you may have done a lot of bad things. I, I know it's hard to believe, but uh, if somebody, yeah, if somebody judges me by what I say or do, they'll never be able to see who I am inside and then call that out. Yeah. You understand? Yeah, I guess I was thinking more like somebody that you know has no relationship with the Lord. Okay, like that's yeah. the un, that's the unholy I was talking about. Mm -hmm. Not somebody that has experienced it and walked away from. I still think in that case, you can call forth who they are. You could see them for who they are, but not necessarily fellowship. Yeah. Okay, that term fellowship is the koinonia. That's sharing all things in common. Remember that says, what fellowship does light have with darkness? Yeah. It doesn't mean you can't be in their presence and call them to that place. The fellowship is, you can't have koinonia with darkness like you can with your brother and sister who are in light. That's what that scripture means. Yeah, it's the difference between association and koinonia. Mm -hmm. It's like when I just said pouring water into water, they you can't right. tell the difference. Anything else? Uh, no more questions, you guys? Hmm? What would you say? I, I think you ought to maybe hit one or two of these. Galatians 2. Which is not one of these. Okay. Oh, it's not. That's okay. Oh, I didn't write it. Okay. It's on my paper, but I didn't write it. How about that? Wow. 
All right, Galatians 2, 20 and 21. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. So he's saying, I live in the flesh. But I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I living, but it's him living in me, even though I'm still living in the flesh. Who loved me and gave himself up for me. goes back to the scripture he was talking about in Ephesians. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. That's a really strong thing by saying, I'm going to go back under works mentality and try and make myself holy. And if I do that, I nullify everything that God did. I do everything that Christ, I nullify everything Christ did on the cross. So who's the working the holiness in us? I think this is where we need to get to. Because a lot of what Paul's talking about here in Galatians, he does it in Romans too, is this idea is, is holiness by works or is holiness by faith or by grace? Okay, so if it's faith or grace, grace through faith, <laughs> then it's the Lord working his holiness in us. Didn't we just read the, the, the holiness that he purchased for us, Ephesians 5, the, the cleanliness that he's doing, the sanctification process he's taking us through? I find that probably the greatest attribute I can give the Lord in this process is surrender, is agreement. It's, I agree, Lord, to the work you're doing in me. Back to this submitting to the uh, authority of the holiness already on the inside of me. It's much, you know, I like Sandy, the way she brings this stuff up, because it's just so real for us. And I like the fact that you think like a Jew, because Jews still think, I got to do something. I got to do something to be holy. I've got to, you know, for lack of a better term, I got to cut myself. I've got to beat myself, punish myself until I'm holy. Come on. What you do is a result of your holiness. What you do does not attain the holiness. Right on. Mm -hmm. Say that again for everybody. That's a very good way of saying it. What you do is a result of your holiness. It does not lead to your holiness. Right on. Mm -hmm. Right on. Perfect. So what the law was trying to do, Christ did. What was the law trying to do? Keep Jews holy. What did Christ do? Finish, complete, make us holy. That sums it up. If you want to keep working law, I don't understand why you'd want to when the guy already did the work for you. Now submit to the work finished in you and allow it to work itself out through you. I'm, a, I'm as hard-headed as any of you, though. I promise you, I am. I know, I still need to do something, right? Don't I? I got to do something, right? It can't be that easy. Yeah, it can't be this. Did you really do it all? Did you really fulfill the law for me? Yeah, I really did, son. I really did. Now, all the power to walk holy is on the inside of you. I've done it. Otherwise, he died needlessly, it says. This is Philippians 3, 9. And may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Yep. And only faith. Right. right on. I think that's a good stop. You okay? Yeah. Yeah. How are you guys doing? August, is that a face with a question? Fellowship? Yeah. Fellowship, 
Okay. Yeah, I like your question. So the question for the microphone is, how do you choose who to have koinonia with and who not to? Who's worthy of your koinonia, so to speak? Good question. It's a great question. So I'll just start. I don't think this is by me any means the full answer. He'll have the full answer. <laughs> Ancient of days himself. Me <laughs> um, and my wife here. An old intercessor friend of ours she's 90 couple years old you guys have probably heard me say this enough told you you've been around a while she said wherever jesus was he had the floor every situation he was in he was the greater influence That's right which means he could have koinonia with anyone because he knew the influence was always from him to them right i think for me the start of the answer, like the tip of the iceberg, is to realize that at some point in time, you're going to come across people who have a greater influence on you than you have on them. And if that influence is positive and light and good, coin a deal with them. If that influence is, because I, I mean, I've met some people in my life that have a stronger influence of darkness than I have of light. I cannot coin a deal with them because I will go the wrong way of what this process has been happening in my life. So I coin an ear with anyone that first wants to coin an ear with me. And secondly, the influence is either good this direction, positive, light, or it's going this way, where I'm bringing them into this process in my life, if I have the floor. If it's light, that's good. If it's darkness, it's not. And I would not have fellowship with that. I don't think you can. So, but, you know, my friend here who has so much more light than me. <laughs> light hair. Light hair. <laughs> I fellowship with him because his light brings more light to my life. So I can coin a Neo with him. You want to answer it better? Yeah, I think everybody's in a different stage. You know, like when you're fresh out of the world, uh, you can't do things that you did in the world because you still have the draw from the things that you did in the world. Let's just say, well, any, any addiction, you can just use the word addiction. We won't call it any addictions. Once you've been sanctified, you can say that, and that spirit of addiction is gone, then it doesn't draw you anymore. You understand? because you've grown up to the point that that spirit doesn't have influence over you, you have influence over it, right. or you have authority over it, you could say it that way. And so that doesn't bother you anymore. But until you get to that point, it's really stupid for you to go back and, you know, you know, poke that stick, poke that snake with a stick. It's the same thing. What he's talking about is, this has decreased right here because you've surrendered to this. And then you can have koinonia with a lot of people. I, I have, a matter of fact, I had somebody this week say, how can you have intimacy with thousands of people like you do? Sometimes, sometimes I'll get up in front of thousands of people and be totally intimate with them. They're like, how can you be intimate with 5,000 people? I break myself open and I'm intimate with them. They see the Lord, they're crying, they're whatever. And it, all the junk going on in the room doesn't bother me at that moment. It doesn't always happen. Now I'm just using it myself as an example because they, this just happened to me this week. I'm literally having coin and with them and I'll never meet them. Because what my job in that instance is to introduce them to the Holy Spirit in a way they've never been able to. So as he opens himself up, the flow of spirit from him is so much stronger than any of the junk that could be flowing from them. So his, his ability to be intimate is strengthened by the flow that comes from him. That's why he can coin an ear with 5,000 people. He has no idea what's going on in their lives. It doesn't matter because the flow from him is overwhelming any of the flow from them. That makes sense? Yeah. You
Lithuania, um, then you don't belong. And then you start to see them kind of use, and you kind of like have that thing that Mark was talking about. Um, I'd like to also propose, isn't it possible that you could go out of Kenya with whoever, but realize that once you start walking in their um, whatever they're doing to the mm -hmm. market, that you enter back into clan again, right? So you see what I mean? Like you don't want to just go bam, okay, you're in clan. You want to go <laughs> koinonia <-ing> with you. <laughs> That's a new word. <laughs> I think sometimes we have a tendency to, to cut somebody off and just say, I'm no more with you. And even after they do this little change, we just keep walking. I wouldn't cut somebody off no. and do that unless the Lord told me to. Yeah. If the Lord tells me to, he trumps all. <laughs> he yeah. trumps all this stuff, you know what I'm saying? You know, what I have seen people do, which I think is healthy. I don't know what it's up with me in circles, but... <laughs> Donuts, yeah. You know, this is you and someone who's here and does what you just said. Maybe the best thing to do is move them here. Okay? So you still have relationship. You still have fellowship, but you don't have the level of intimacy. These are all circles of greater and greater intimacy with you. So if this person is really beginning to walk in such a way that's affecting you negatively, you don't cut off relationship, but you maybe back off the amount of intimacy you have with them. Or you still keep connection but the intimacy level changes a little bit. I think that's wise in certain relationships. Until this you gets strong enough that it doesn't matter where they are, their intimacy level doesn't affect your ability to still walk as you walk. I just want to make sure because it almost sounded maybe I'm, I'm a very black and white person. And I'm just really? <laughs> <laughs> just cut them off. <laughs> but I ain't black and white. New York Jesus has a Yeah, yeah. But once you come to a place in relationship with with people, though, I'll go uh, maybe a step further than what Mark was talking about. Uh, and you know people so well. Uh, here's four examples right here. I'm so close to these guys, all from Ukraine. And um, when you are that close, literally, like they're my children, and I'm their dad. I can be going through a hard time. I can be going through hell and they know it and it doesn't drag them down. They know what I'm going through and they love me anyway and they pray for me and they actually press in tighter rather than, you know, farther away. So they're actually showing the Lord to me when I go through a hard place and the same is true for me. You understand? That's when... That's when the place that you don't break, that's what like real koinonia is. This, I don't, I don't think would happen if they're inside truly like with these guys. I don't think it, I don't think it would happen. Yeah. Well, you don't have you that understand? relation. You don't have that relationship with everybody. No, huh? Yeah. Mm -mm. No, you can't have that with thousands of people. Mm -hmm. You understand? But I've, like Yana, I've known her forever. How many years? Well, I knew her as a kid, but then maybe reintroduced her to her the last 10 years or something. But even knowing somebody, we've been through so many things that um, you, would, you would never cut them off. That's, that never even enters into the equation when you come to a certain place in relationship. Yep. That's, to me, it's a very common um, foreign concept. I think until I spoke to Cash Jr. Um, because I, if you, I, I've, I've gone through that, you know, Sandy was a struggle for me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Then we're done with you. So I guess you could almost say, like, clean me when I was in college and we're going to have a clean me thing. It's completely different than what we're going to talk about. It is. Here. You won't understand it. To, you won't understand it until you walk in it. I know it's hard to say that. Right. Jesus, Jesus had the same fellowship, the same koinonia with all 12 of his disciples, correct? Even Thomas, even Judas. Jesus knew that Judas was going to do everything 
and he never rejected him. And he even loved him when he said, go ahead, Judas, and do what you're supposed to do. He didn't go, you know, you're out because you betrayed me. I, this is my personal belief that, G, that Judas killed himself because he could not handle that kind of love. That Jesus knew he was going to betray him, had to betray him, and Judas could not handle it after he, after he did it. Yep. He's like, I just can't believe he loved me that much. And physically and emotionally and mentally couldn't take it, and he killed himself. And right there is the culture the church is supposed to be walking in. That was the original culture and acts of the church. They continued that even after Jesus' ascension. And we have so watered down what church culture there is now that we, I mean, this, this it excites you and it also freaks people out because we are so used to hiding. Now, this is serious. We have gotten so good at hiding that, because we don't believe that people love us enough that if they see all of us, they'll continue in that secret place with me. No, they're going to move me out. When they really see what's going on in here, when they really know who I am, uh -huh. they won't be in fellowship with me anymore. Yeah. True Koinonia doesn't do that. True Koinonia says, actually draws closer. Oh, yeah. I got an example for you. Actually, I, I've got this friend of mine. I won't tell you who he is or where he's from, but he's a really successful pastor. He probably has five or 6,000 people in his church, and it's built on koinonia. And uh, so I was with this guy several times this year, just hanging out in different meetings and just different stuff. And so he told me the story. I was with him uh, a couple weeks ago, and uh, he told me this story where he had just this huge blow up with his wife. I mean a blow up cursing, swearing, throwing stuff, everything. And right in the middle of this, he said, literally, I had a mental breakdown, and I was so angry. This stuff just started boiling out of me. And he said, right when that happened, my phone was in my pocket, and I butt called this lady in our church. And he's using every, you know, swear word. And this lady's like, you know, gets a call, and she call her ID, so she knows who's calling. And right in the middle of this, just knock down, drag out, blah, you know, she's just listening, Pastor, hello, you know. <laughs> and then, man, they're giving it to each other, you know. And so the next day, this lady calls him and said, Pastor, you know, such and such, I can't, can't say who it is. I just wanted to let you know that you, you know, you must have but called me last night when you were having this, you know, heated discussion. <laughs> and he got, he said, oh, man, you know, he couldn't even hardly say anything. And she said, wait a minute before you say anything. She said, you have extended grace to me dozens and dozens of times, and now it's my turn. And he just burst into tears, and he could not control it. Sunday morning, which was two days later, he gets up and tells his entire church of five or 6,000 people everything he said, everything he did. Come on. I am not lying That's to you. That's awesome. And every single person in that church extended them grace and covered them. There's koinonia. That's real koinonia. I went, you're actually living what you believe wow. instead of, you know, the business end of church. <laughs> All right, Sunday morning, get ready. <laughs> Who are you gonna butt call, Mark? Chuck, a Chuck Abler's coming up. <laughs> He's gonna. <laughs> I ain't doing it yet. No. Yeah. <laughs> oh. And she even used the word we're talking about. She's like, "I knew something just you know had happened to you or whatever. You've extended me grace dozens of times. It's my turn to extend it to you." And I'm like, and that grace freed him to can be completely honest with everybody and everybody extended him grace. How can we help you? How can we do whatever? It was unreal. Instead of going, you know, you really shouldn't be talking to your wife like that, which is true, but it made, I mean, he fell on their faces repenting because I don't even know what the argument was. He didn't tell me it, was, it didn't matter. It was, the, it was the grace was extended. I mean, it literally opened him up to everybody in this church then. I went, Oh my gosh, I've known him for 27 years. He's crazy. <laughs> That's awesome. Good? Yeah? All right. We love you.